Whitney. Thank yous, among them to Charlie for coming back on my last Sunday, and for some special people from uh, Hendersonville, uh, First United Methodist Church that worked with me on the staff there. Thank you all for being here, it means so much. And for all of you. This is Trinity Sunday, as you know, beginning with Advent, we once again have been retelling Jesus' story, walking with him, listening to him, so we might become more like him, his disciples. As United Methodists put it, for the transformation of the world. This Sunday, Trinity Sunday, kind of wraps up the story. God the Father has been involved. Jesus has been involved. Pentecost Sunday, the Holy Spirit is involved. One of the few places where we find an overt reference to the Trinity is in Jesus' great commission of the disciples at the end of Matthew's Gospel. Hear it again. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Earlier this year, Fred Craddock died. F probably no teacher of preachers has had more influence on the past generation of preachers than Fred Craddock. He was a Disciples of Christ minister, ordained in that church, as well as a teacher of New Testament and preaching. He was from West Tennessee, from Humboldt, not too far from Brownsville, where Charlie's from. Fred came to the Candler School of Theology after I had already left. But I went back and spent a week with him and then heard him on several occasions, read his books, listened to his tapes. This is what he wrote about his father. When I was growing up in West Tennessee, my father didn't go to church. He was at home fussing about lunch, being late on Sunday. Once in a while, the pastor would come and try to talk to him, and he was the kind of, kind of rough on the minister. He would say, I know what you people want down there at the church. You want another name on the roll and another pledge. It embarrassed my mother. She would stay in the kitchen and cry. Once in a while, they would have a guest evangelist. And he would come with the pastor, and the pastor would say, here's a tough one, sick him. My father would always say something like, you don't care about me, you just want another member on the roll, another pledge, another dollar in the plate. One time, he didn't say it. 
He was in the Veterans Hospital in Memphis. I rushed across the country to see him. He was down to 74 pounds. They had taken out his throat. They said it was too late. All that radium stuff had just burned him to pieces. They put in a tube so he could breathe, but he couldn't speak. I looked around the room at the cut flowers and the potted plants with little cards sprinkled all about, and every one of them, men's Bible class, women's Bible class, youth fellowship, every one of them came from persons within the church. He saw me looking. He took a pencil and wrote on the side of a Kleenex box a line from Hamlet. In this harsh world, draw your breath in pain to tell my story. I ask, what is your story, Dad? And he wrote this confession, I was wrong. I guess that's why, if I were going to summarize why I've been a pastor for Forty and a half years. It's because I believe the life we have been given is so precious, we don't want to waste it. We don't want to come to the end of it and look back over our life and make the confession Fred's father made. I was wrong. As I look back over my ministry, there are times in which I think to myself, maybe I was wrong about this or about that. And then I think by grace and age, I've come to see that so much of life isn't about right and wrong. Some of it is are doing the best we can with what we've got at a particular time. And so I'm left not feeling the need to judge myself. I was wrong so much as I'm finding myself wondering. It's wondering about things about which I have to admit I simply don't know. This morning, I want to share with you how ministry, how church has changed since I started doing it back in 1975. I want to share with you what I've tried to do, what has been sort of a guiding principle for the way I have pastored the churches I've pastored. And then I want to share with you not a self-justification, not a, not a defense of my leadership style, but again, a rationale to help you understand why I've done it the way I've done it. Whether it was the right way or not, I don't, I wonder. God will have to make that, that judgment. When I started out in the church, folks were concerned about how one denomination differed from another. How many of you 
are old enough to remember once saved, always saved, or can you fall from grace? Does anybody remember that? That was the big debate between Baptist and Methodist. We spent a lot of time on that debate. <clears throat> I remember I remember when Protestants were still reluctant to do anything that might be accused of being Roman Catholic. I remember when the church started observing Advent and there were those who said we shouldn't do that because that's Catholic. And the assumption was that if it was Catholic, it was wrong. It was evil. Because you know what Catholics believe, don't you? Well, most of us didn't know what Catholics believe. We just had been taught that we should stay away from them and not associate with them. And a mixed marriage back then was a marriage between a Protestant and a Catholic or a Baptist and a Methodist. Now, because I came from another denomination into the United Methodist Church, I had walked down that road personally of trying to figure out what's at stake in the difference between the denominations. All along carrying with me the experience of having had a Church of Christ mother and a Roman Catholic father going to a Presbyterian college. But I found that I could help persons on that journey of sorting out what they believed and more importantly, removing those obstacles that, was getting, that were getting in the way of their being fully Jesus' person, Jesus' disciple. Now things have changed over the last 40 years. Those of us who used to debate how we were different now are just trying to survive. And there are those out there that are saying, take the name Baptist off the sign, take the name Methodist off the sign. All of that is negative baggage skidding in people's way. And so the churches that are growing today don't wear a denominational label. And I wonder, as I watch those new churches and their growth, I wonder, is that where the Spirit is now leading? Because there was a time when people looked at John Wesley and the Methodist movement and thought they were weird. They were called because they were filled with the Spirit. They were called enthusiast. And John Wesley took the church out of the church building, out into the world. And people thought that was wrong. And yet it became the foundation for our United Methodist Church and denomination. Sometimes I wonder, I wonder. Back when I was in theology school, H. Richard Niebuhr wrote a book called Christ and Culture. And in that book, he sorted out various options for understanding Christ's relationship to the culture. One of them was Christ against culture. Christ is right, everything that's in the culture is wrong, bad, stay away from it. Christ above culture, Christ transforming culture. The main thing is that there was a sense that while we may well need to change, not all change is good. Not all change is evil. Now, how do you make a decision? How do you sort through what is of God and what is not of God? And how can you predict the long-range consequences of some of the changes? Is the church today becoming more like Starbucks? 
a good thing? Is, it is the church today becoming more like a concert hall? The churches that are growing don't build sanctuaries today, they build auditoriums. <laughs> Should the church, you know, one of the, lately, one of the biggest, one of the biggest concerns I've had lately is what I ought to wear on Sunday morning. Now, we, Bucky and I actually asked them, the worship team, should we wear robes for this service? Since you all don't, should we just dress like normal people? A week ago Thursday, my, uh, my fourth grade grandson graduated from fourth grade. <laughs> and the biggest, and the biggest venue for the graduation was at a Baptist church where the pastor came out and welcomed us. And you know what he was wearing? He was wearing the new robe. A shirt with the shirt tail out and jeans. No kidding, that's the new robe today. Or a t-shirt and sport coat. Yeah, Jeans, shirt tail out, that's the new robe. Now what makes this so confusing for someone old like me is I remember at Hendersonville, the big debate long ago on whether it was okay to wear a polo shirt and not a suit and tie to church. Because there was that generation that said, you bring your best to God and your best in your closet is your suit and tie and that's what you should be wearing. And all those folks that wore polo shirts or open collar shirts were viewed Mac as heathen. We got through that, I thought, <laughs> except today I'm being told that my robe is getting in the way of people and I can see where that might be a little too much for someone who thinks the robe represents something that uh, turns people off. The church has changed. It's changing. Second thing I wanted to tell you about in terms of my stopping and reflecting back on, on my ministry is what I've tried to do. You all know, Deb told me this morning that I'm a teacher and she's glad it looks like I might have an opportunity to teach. And I am a teacher. My teaching has, has been twofold. One is more reflection, the other is more, more content. And I know it gets heavy sometimes. Steve Ernst gave me an article a couple of weeks ago and, and in that article there was a paragraph that said, the only place left in our American society where people on a regular basis are invited to think and reflect on their lives is in church. Where else are you invited to ask questions like, what is life all about? What is my life all about? How am I supposed to, to deal with the experience of injustice, unfair, and life is unfair? Where does that go on? Anywhere else except in church. And because that process of reflection and learning has been so much a part of my own spiritual journey, that's been a large part of my ministry and especially my preaching ministry. And so I've tried to do two things at the same time. I've tried to help people connect the dots of their lives. And the, and the way I think we Christians do that is by learning the larger meta story of our faith. That story that comes from the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures and the New Testament, Jesus and the early church. We tell that story and inside that story, we see if our individual stories make a connection so that the larger story gives our stories meaning and the result our lives a sense of purpose. I've always felt again that 
If we don't ask those questions and do that work during our lives, we come to the end of them and we look back and we wonder if we've wasted them or not lived them the way we wish we had. And so I know, I know that my style for some has been more heady than experiential. Fred Craddock in his teaching said you've got to make, you've got to tell stories that help people experience the faith. Then you can help them understand about the faith or reflect on it. And sometimes I wonder if I've had that in the best balance. The last thing I wanted to uh, share with you is how I've understood my leadership style. Because I know there are those who feel like I've not had one. Early on, when, um, when I did my Doctor of Ministry degree, I looked, at, I looked at the church and how it's organized and how it functions. And it occurred to me that the United Methodist Church isn't organized the way it is simply because it saw the way our government at every level is organized and therefore we kind of just replicated that. You, you've almost got a direct correlation bet between local governments and as you move up in the church. I mean, we even have our Supreme Court. We call it the Judicial Council. Um, we have a Congress it's called General Conference where we make laws, Book of Discipline. Uh, the local church is like a town or city government. And you can just, you can do that. What I came to see is that the way, the reason we're as democratic as we are is that there is a very real, although most of the time unspoken, trust, belief, that the Holy Spirit has been given to every believer. And we come out of a tradition the Protestant Reformation, where we believe in the priesthood of all believers, and therefore, my priesthood is no different, no better, no authoritative, no more powerful than yours. And therefore, your voice is as important as mine. And for that reason, I've never felt that as a pastor, I should be telling you what to do. My style has been, let's get together and talk about it together and see how the Holy Spirit gives all of us a voice and see what that voice says to us about where we ought to go and what we ought to do together. Otherwise, in my opinion, the church becomes a personality cult. And we've seen too often what happens when the church becomes a personality cult. You are the church. Not I or any other pastor alone. My role, I understand it, is to help you be the church. Discern where the Holy Spirit's moving among us in this situation, at this time, in this place. It's been called the empowerment of the laity. And I've been committed to that. And one of the ways I feel like the laity of the church is empowered is by letting you make decisions that I disagree with. To show you that I respect the Holy Spirit's work in you as much as I respect it in me as your pastor. And so I wonder if maybe I, at times, had too soft a leadership style. Maybe I should have been more direct, like Bob Newhart. Have you seen this video? John, have you gone to sleep? <laughs> that you wish to address. Oh, okay. Uh, well, I have this fear of being buried alive in a box. <laughs> I just, I start thinking about being buried alive and I
begin to panic. Has, has, has anyone ever, ever tried to, to bury you alive in a box? No. No, but truly thinking about it does make my life horrible. I mean, I can't go through tunnels or be in an elevator or in a house. Anything boxy. So what, what you're saying is you're, uh, you're claustrophobic. Uh, yes. Yes, that's it. All right. Well, uh, let's go, Catherine. I'm, uh, I'm going to uh, say two words to you right now. I, I want you to listen to them very, very carefully. Then I want you to take them out of the office with you and incorporate them in, into your life. Well, shall I uh, write them down? Well, it, if it makes you comfortable, it's just two words. Most, we find most people can, uh, can remember them. <laughs> okay. You ready? Yes. Okay, here, here they are. Stop it! <laughs> I'm sorry? Stop it! Stop it? Yes, S-T-O-P, new word, IT. So, what are you saying? <laughs> you, you know, it's funny. I, I, I say two simple words, and I cannot tell you the amount of people who say exactly the same thing you're saying. I mean, this, you know, this is not Yiddish, Catherine. This is English. <laughs> stop it. So, I should just stop it. There you go. I mean, you, you, you don't want to go through life being scared of being buried alive in a box, do you? I mean, that... Sounds, sounds frightening. <laughs> yes. Then stop it. I, I can't. I mean, it's been with me no, since childhood. No, no, childhood. no, no. We, 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 we don't go there. Just, just stop. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder if I should have been more assertive with my leadership <laughs> and said to people, just stop it. I remember when I started as a pastor, I, uh, I thought to myself how fortunate I am to have the opportunity to do this, um, to be invited into people's lives at a level that requires, I know, a lot of trust, that's rare and precious. Many of you have invested in me that trust, and I thank you. When I lived in Hendersonville, I could stand on my porch of where I lived and look over and see the Christmas lights at Trinity City. You've heard of the 12 days of Christmas. Trinity City celebrates the 12 months of Christmas. And in my judgmentalism, I, I said, those folks are just off the wall wrong. And then someone sends me this YouTube video of one of their guests on their, one of their programs. And he probably does as good a job as I've ever heard describing what we pastors do and what you do as members of the church. People often say to me, they say, J. John, you know, what, what do you do? Uh, it's always very difficult to know what to say. Because if I say to you that I'm a reverend, which I am, that conjures up certain images in people's minds as to what I might be. So I like to be a little bit creative in telling people what I do. I sat next to this lady on an aeroplane at Heathrow Airport. And I said, hello. And she said, well, hello. And I said, where are you going? And she says, I'm going to Singapore. Then she said to me, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Australia. I said, what do you do? So she told me. Then she said, what do you do? And I said, well. <laughs> I work for a global enterprise. She said, do you? I said, yes, I do. I said, we've got outlets in nearly every country of the world. <laughs> She said, have you? I said, yes, we have. 
I said, we've got hospitals and hospices and homeless shelters. I said, we do marriage work. We've got orphanages. We've got feeding programs, <laughs> educational <laughs> programs. I said, we do all sorts of justice and reconciliation things. I said, basically, we look after people from birth to death <laughs> and we deal in the area of behavioural alteration. <laughs> She went, wow! <laughs> and it was so loud, her wow, loads of people turned around and looked at us. She says, what's it called? <laughs> I said, it's called the church. <laughs> <laughs> If we are a follower of Jesus, wow. then we are part of a global That's enterprise. It. But not only is it global, it's intergalactic because it includes everyone that's gone before us. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I could not have been a pastor of this kind of church if it weren't for folks like you. So thank you. I invite you to remain standing. Let's sing together of the work that we share. Together we serve. Ushers will receive our morning offering. And a 
time to every purpose under heaven. A time to build up, a time to break down, a time to dance, a time to mourn, a time to cast away souls, a time to gather souls together. To everything turn, 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 there is a sea. Turn, 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 and a time to every purpose under heaven. A time of love, a time of hate, a time of war, a time of peace. A time you may embrace, a time to read. United Methodist Book of Worship, there is a ritual called Farewell to a Pastor, and I would like for you all to join me in that ritual at this time. I thank you, the members and friends of Lebanon First United Methodist Church, for the love and support you have shown me while I have ministered among you. I am grateful for the ways my leadership has been accepted. I ask forgiveness for the mistakes I have made. As I leave, I carry with me all that I have learned. I accept your gratitude and forgiveness, and I forgive you, trusting that our time together and our parting are pleasing to God. I release you from turning to me and depending on me as your pastor. I encourage your continuing ministry here and will pray for you and for your new pastor. Mike Potts. Let us pray. Oh God, for the way you brought us together and now for the way that you are leading us apart, for the changes that have worked in all of us individually and together as a church, for your blessing now upon Mike Potts and his family, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
ask you to be seated prior to my benediction. And on this Trinity Sunday, I know of no better benediction than this. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be and abide with us today and forever. And I'm, I'm going to ask one thing of you. Old age brings a few privileges, and one of those, as I leave, is going to be dictating how the reception is going to go. <laughs> I don't like lines. And so Karen and I invite you all, mill around, talk with each other, stop by and talk to us, but please don't line up and wait. Agreed? Thank you. I pray you'll be all right and watch us where we And help us to be wise in times when we don't know. Let this be our prayer when we lose our way. Lead us to with your grace to a place where we'll be safe. I pray we'll find your light and hold it in our hearts when stars go out each night, eterna stella se. Oh, nella mia preghiera, let this be a prayer. Quanta fede c'è, when shadows fill our day, lead us to a place. Us with your grace, give us faith so we'll be saved. Sogniamo un mondo senza più violenza, un mondo di giustizia, di speranza, ognuno di
peace.